Angelini, Mills, Woods, and Ori, and she heads their workers' compensation practice there. And um, what you may not know uh, about Dina is that she's a dedicated member of the Women's Bar Association, which is what brings her here today to talk to us about diversity and inclusion uh, issues. So without further ado, as soon as I get this set up here, we're going to have Dina come on up. Okay. Uh, as Dave mentioned before, starting this year, one of the professional responsibility requirements that the MCLE board established was the fact that there needs to be an hour of diversity. So, um, if any of you are slightly annoyed that you're going to sit here and listen to me talk for an hour on the inclusion of women, it may be an indicator that these programs are necessary. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go through a couple things. I'm going to go through general statistics of women in the legal profession. I am going to go through some issues and concerns with equal pay um, nationwide as well as in the legal profession. I'm going to go through the ethical considerations that play into these issues. And then for those that think it's really not that big of a deal or really that prevalent in the legal profession, I'm going to go through and give you real life examples of things that have happened to me women I know over the last couple of years, and maybe it'll show you that it's a little more prevalent than we think. <laughs> um, these statistics come from an annual study from the ABA Commission of Women in the Legal Profession. Uh, they're called the Current Glance of Women, and they come out every single year, and it's a great resource uh, to go on and look. Uh, so the last published study was the 2017 study that has the 2016 statistics. At that point, women comprised 36% of the legal profession. Now, that's true, even though we're about 48, 49% of JDs being awarded are to women. So there is a significant decrease from the amount of JDs being awarded and the amount of women in the legal profession. However, it's unsure really where these numbers are possibly skewed from. So for example, there's plenty of people in this room, I'm sure, that when they graduated, they graduated with two or three women in their law school class. You still That still comprises a large amount of our legal profession. So I think that brings that number down. Um, I, I personally know women that went into consulting jobs or you know went back to their prior professions before they went to law school because of the job offers and the pay that they were being offered. But again, I think that that number may be somewhat skewed by the overreaching population in general. Um, if you look in private practice in 2016, women partners were just slightly above 20%. And equity partners was down to 18%. Um, same thing with managing partners in the top 200 biggest law firms. Uh, I will tell you that the ABA was gracious enough to give me the potential 2018 stats that are going to be the 2017 data. It's not yet published yet, uh, but right now it's, it's women actually went down 1% to 35% in 2017. Uh, partners in private practice stayed pretty much the same. It's a little over, you know, around 22%. Um, Equity partners went up 1% to 19, and managing partners in law firms was a significant increase to 23%. I'll tell you that part of that is because companies are paying attention, and diversity is becoming important to companies and their image, and that that's private companies versus insurance companies, and they're paying attention and they're promoting from within. They also publish statistics on the wage gap that you will see in here. There is a slight difference. So this comes from their statistics as well as the uh, National Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is a little bit behind. Uh, this slide you'll see shows in 2015, the disparity was women were making 89.7% of their male counterparts. I'm not really sure where that came from because as you see from the years prior, that's a huge disparity. And if you look at um, 2016, oops. 
that went back down to 76% or 77.6%. So I'm not sure where that anomaly almost was in 2015, because in 2016 it went back to 77.8. Uh, it's a little bit, when you start getting into the 200 biggest law firms and equity partners, that, that gap narrows, it goes down to women are making 94% of their male counterparts. It still doesn't explain why there's a gap at all um, when they're in the same boat. Um, the national disparity in equal pay is at 80% right now. Um, so we're, we're actually, in the legal profession, we're actually lower than the national average. Uh, Illinois is right there on the cusp. They're slightly before, below the nat national average. In Illinois, women make 79 cents per uh, every dollar that their male counterpart makes. If you guys pay attention or anybody's seen National Equal Pay Day, that falls on the day it takes a woman to reach 100% of their male counterpart's pay. So there's an actual reason that that day lands on the day it does. And so the farther away that is from the beginning of the year, that's what it's illustrated of. And we hope that that closes. You may think that like 80 cents on the dollar isn't that bad. Again, some of us ask ourselves why there's a disparity at all. Um, but the sad part is, is that that's been pretty stagnant for like the last five years. There's not really any increase. So we're not actually getting any better. Um, industries like ours, it's a little bit different because you can argue there's all kinds of factors that play into it. There's skill, there's experience, there's all kinds of factors. Uh, when you listen, when you hear equal pay statistics nationwide, you're talking about the factory worker that is sitting there next to their male counterpart and still making less when there's no factors that play into that other than the fact that it's discriminatory. So some of the reasons based on research that, you know, this disparity in pay exists um, is obvious employer bias and lack of anti-discrimination policies. Uh, no matter how small your firm is, no matter how big your firm is, having these anti-discriminatory policies are important. And it's not enough to just have them. You have to enforce them and you have to walk the walk. Um, there is such thing when, the, when you talk about unequal pay is what's called the motherhood penalty. And that women are held back because they, men either anticipate that they are having babies or they are gonna have babies. And no matter what their track record is or what's available to them, they don't get promoted enough or take the next step or given the same responsibilities. I will tell you that if someone's partnership track changes because they had a baby or they may be having a baby or pregnant, believe me, these women are paying attention and they're well aware of the fact of why it's happening. And even though it may not be talked about, it is being talked about in the legal community and the women are talking. And we're well aware of the fact that that actually does exist. Um, unwilling to negotiate, it's surprising, like, women don't want to go and ask for a rate. And they don't have those conversations at the same pace as men, or are not willing to do it as quickly as men, and they don't insert themselves up. And that is something, you know, with the lead-in policy and other campaigns that have been going on, that women need to stand up and get a seat at the table. Um, there should be open lines of communication as well, and transparency of your pay scale is important too. So a lot of times, those days of hiding what the pay scale is or what counterparts are making has kind of been closing. And people are talking more than you think they are. Um, people don't keep that under wraps as much anymore. Uh, flexible work schedules are extremely important uh, at the end of the day. And I think that's a little bit different for potentially petitioners versus respondents because petitioners have to be available to their clients maybe at a different rate. Uh, but if you're getting your work done, that flexibility of schedule can make a huge difference. And actually the research has shown that that actually increases productivity because they're able to schedule themselves appropriately. Uh, there's also some indication that there's a lack of mentor-mentee relationships for women. 
uh, in the legal community. And when a majority of equity partners or those in charge are men, they're usually reluctant to take on mentees that are women. And that's a great disservice. And there's just not enough of those women at the top around to mentor everybody. Um, those mentor-mentee relationships are extremely important and something that you should encourage within your firms, even if it's not in your firm. So the Women's Bar Association, uh, multiple other bar associations, even law schools participate in mentor-mentee programs. And that's something you should encourage all your attorneys, not just women, to participate in to guide them through their career. The other thing just to note about minority statistics in the legal profession, um, in 2017, the Minority Corporate Council Association uh, reported that while minorities make up a third of the legal profession, only 16% of attorneys and law firms are minorities. And of that 16%, only 9% are partners. And furthermore, of that 9%, only like somewhere between two and three percent of minority partners are women. Uh, and then and as of 2015 was the latest stat I could find, but about three percent of law firm associates um, identified in that LGBTQ community and only slightly below two percent of those individuals are partners. So there's clearly an overall diversity issue within our legal profession. One of the current pieces of legislation that we are trying to get enacted that I, I feel is extremely important to combating the equal pay issue is the No Wage History Act. And so what that does is it prohibits an employer from screening applicants based on their wage and salary history, requiring that their salary of their prior salaries meet a minimum or maximum requirement, and require that they disclose their salary history as a condition of being interviewed or considered for employment, and from gathering that, in, that salary history from prior employers. So here's where the disparity in pay perpetuates and it's never gonna change, is because I walk into your office and, and you ask me what I used to make. And if I make below the industry standard because I'm a woman or for whatever reason, you're gonna tailor your job offer to my salary history, not the, compared to what my male counterparts or other counterparts are making. And so when you start off below, you're constantly gonna stay low if that becomes part of the conversation in your job interview. You should have a pay scale for what you pay attorneys with a certain amount of experience and a certain amount of years. And that shouldn't tailor because of their prior history. And you also see a lot of women working in public interest, especially like out of law school, and clearly those numbers are gonna be lower. And when they make the transition into you know, private law firms, this no salary history app is imperative to making sure we even out that pay scale. Um, it was first introduced last year in 2017. It passed both the House and the Senate, and then the governor vetoed it. Uh, it just popped back up at, at the end of November, uh, and it's in its. It just got its second reading uh, last month at the end of last month. So it's still trying to get pushed through as law. That's something to look out for because if it actually if it does get passed and that's something that you have in your interview process, uh, it's it's going to be a problem for you. So it's something that all employers should have their their kind of eye on in the future. So when we talk about discrimination in the law, whether it's uh, based on sex or race or any other issues. Uh, it's really tied to the ethics rules that exist. So outside of Title VII, where there's an actual discrimination case or a criminal action, uh, it's really tied to our ethics. So there are, when you're facing discrimination or you've seen discrimination, there's a couple of things you can do. Obviously, you can go and report to the ARC. What some people don't know is that you can also report to the chief judges. Um, 
you can report straight to Judge Castillo in the federal district courts. You can go straight to Judge Evans in the circuit court and report that conduct <laughs> that will get investigated and looked into outside of what the ARDC may do. So for example, I have not personally seen this play out in civil court. I have seen a play out in federal court uh, where there were allegations, serious allegations made against an attorney uh, that were not denied. And the federal court pulled their license to practice in front of federal court for two years. And they kicked him out of the court. Um, so those are aspects that people don't know necessarily that they can go to um, outside of a formal complaint with the ARDC. So rule 4.4 is one of those ethical ties. So the other thing is, is these rules that I'm about to talk to are, are about are the rules that the ARDC often in these kind of discrimination situations grab onto and that's what they bring the charges on. So rule 4.4 says that in representing a client, a lawyer shall not use means that have no substantial purpose other than to embarrass, delay, or burden a third person, or use methods of obtaining evidence that violate the legal rights of such a person. Um, obviously that is extremely expansive and includes conduct to any attorney, uh, but that is one of the ethics rules that the ARDC will grab onto. Rule 8.4D 8 .8 says that a lawyer, it's misconduct for a lawyer to engage in conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. And 8.4J is the current rule that regulates where you would find harassment falling under. So the issue with that rule is the fact that one of the issues is that it talks about the administration of justice. So the issue with that is the fact that it doesn't cover conduct outside of representing a client or in a courtroom. So it's not regulating what you're doing in your law firm, what you're doing in social events, what you're doing if you're mentoring. It's only kind of in those kind of tribunal situations. Um, it also only covers misconduct that violates federal, state, or local statutes. So one of the things that you're, you're seeing kind of nationwide in the problem with discrimination is the fact that in a Title VII case or any other discrimination case, it is, you don't have a valid basis for an action unless there is an adverse employment action. Unless you're fired, not given promotions, taken time away from you. So basically in those situations, you can be treated however inappropriately it is as long as it doesn't have an adverse employment action. And that's one of the biggest problems. And that's why people are looking to ethic considerations to find another avenue. Um, I think for most women and for these campaigns that you're seeing nationwide right now, the idea is accountability and and the like knowing the prevalence of the issue. Not that someone necessarily needs to be sued or have huge consequences, but that there needs to be accountability for these actions. Um, so the current rule also only makes it a violation if it affects the attorney, if reflects adversely on the attorney's fitness as a lawyer. Uh, so again, that kind of gets tied to the performance of law as opposed to everything else that we are exposed to in the legal community. Um, and the last thing that the current rule does is it's only a violation if a tribune has found so. So unless a court or an, another tri tribunal finds you guilty, it's not, you don't really violate this rule as it stands. There is, the ABA 8.4G is the new proposed rule that the ABA has adopted. It has not been adopted in Illinois yet, and it has not been adopted in a lot of states. Uh, one of the main differences is the prior, the current ethical rule doesn't actually even use the word harassment. So harassment isn't even covered in the rule, just discrimination. So the new rule that says it's a violation to engage in conduct that the lawyer knows or reasonably knows, should know is harassment or discrimination on the basis of race, sex, religion, national origin, ethnicity, disability, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, marital status, or socioeconomic status in the conduct related to the practice of law. 
So what that does is it takes that definition and it broadens it. So related to the practice of law is going to include all those other things that you're doing outside of your actual case. Your employer-employee relationships, your mentoring issues, all those kind of other real life situations where we see this prevalence of sexual harassment and discrimination. So the other, the other interesting thing is because the, the, the current rule doesn't actually even cover corporate legal departments because they're not in the practice of, or they're not in the administration of your law. So there's huge aspects and sectors of the legal community that aren't covered by the current ethical standards. Um, so one of the biggest problems is, one of the biggest arguments against this new proposed rule is that it's too broad. So people are saying, well, that infringes on my First Amendment rights. And what is the practice of law? So one of the concerns that people are using to counter this rule is, well, I sit on the board of my church, or I you know, have affiliations with political parties. And because I'm a lawyer, that can stretch over into those areas that have nothing to do with my job as a lawyer, and I can bring, be brought up on charges in that. So that's one of the main uh, criticisms. So that's still, they're still working on that, they're still tweaking on it. Um, you see that the backup, especially in Illinois, a lot of the minority bar associations back it. The ISBA has some of those general concerns that are concerns all around, so it has not yet passed. Um, and again, the comment three that you'll see on this slide starts focusing on the harassment issue that is hugely prevalent right now that is missing from the current law. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about these anti-sexual harassment campaigns that are sweeping the nation and kind of what they are, in case anybody is confused by them or uh, not sure what they were really about. Um, I will tell you that, well, Me Too has actually been around for over a decade. Uh, it just kind of hit in October 2017 when they started a social media campaign with the hashtag Me Too that women and men, not just women, can share their stories of the sexual harassment they've experienced in their life, mostly focusing on in the workplace. And the idea of that was just to show people how prevalent it was and how common it was for someone to experience that in their life when most people think it's not that big of an issue. I will tell you that right after this campaign hit, I was in a couple um, social, legal setting where men would like have a conversation and say something and be like, wait, 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 that's not gonna end up on me too, right? And it's just kind of like, you know, it's part of me was like, well, that's great. They actually know it exists. And part of me was like, well, then you don't really understand what's happening. Uh, and that kind of kicked off all the other campaigns that came to light. Uh, Time's Up is, so what happened is that Me Too kind of gave these, this overall general, this is the problem with sexual harassment for men and women, uh, mostly in the workplace. And then you started seeing these subsector campaigns like Time's Up. And Time's Up was taking that same idea with Me Too and bringing it into the film industry. And uh, they are raising billions of dollars to fund, uh, to fund legal services for people that can't afford them that have experienced that in the workplace. So when you see that Time's Up campaign, it's an extension of the Me Too, but specific to that industry. Illinois Say No More was a campaign that hit with an open letter to an editor by, by two women who were sharing the sexual harassment stories that they experienced in Illinois politics uh, between the politicians, the, um, the other professionals in that industry, the lobbyists, and it immediately grabbed attention of our legislatures and there was a House resolution introduced by Sarah Feitzold in the, in the House of Representatives 
urging lawmakers to actively change the culture that breeds sexual harassment in Illinois politics that was adopted. Um, from there, Speaker Mike Madigan put a House amendment. It was um, set a bill 402 to tighten up kind of the aspects of how sexual harassment complaints in Illinois politics were handled. So what they were seeing is the fact that you could violate their ethics code, which again is how it's regulated in that industry just like ours, because it's got to be tied to an ethics code. Otherwise, you're just left with Title VII or the criminal statutes, and those standards are extremely high. But what there wasn't was a single consequence that went with it. So what you were seeing is that these investigations didn't really go anywhere. And um, so they had a House committee meeting. I and one of my colleagues from the Women's Bar Association were fortunate enough to go and testify at that committee hearing. And we testified about how prevalent that issue is and we connected with these women because we experienced the same thing on a daily basis in the legal profession. Um, and that, it, what's funny is I think you see, while it exists, I think it's less and less because we're lawyers and you kind of know what conduct you're supposed to you know, avoid as an employer. And the sexual harassment and the discrimination that we see on a daily basis in the legal profession is largely connected to judges and co-counsels or at social events or these professional events. Uh, it's much more common to experience that at, at the hands of a colleague than it is necessarily your employer. Uh, and so we connected to them on that, on that basis and went to speak to them about how we supported this new amendment. It was interesting, it was adopted, and not only that, they required, the committee required Speaker Madigan to fill the position of the Inspector General uh, overseeing this ethics committee uh, that had been vacant for like four years. And within three weeks, they appointed the IG, and that that is, you know, being handled in Illinois politics with a little bit more dedication and attention. So, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is kind of there's that overt sexism and then there's like soft sexism. And um, if I'm about to offend anybody with the language I'm using, you should be offended. Um, it is very common, more common than you think, for female attorneys by their colleagues and others to be called a bitch or a con. Now, I am overly positive that there's people in this room that have called me a bitch before. They just never said it to my face. <laughs> so it is more surprising, like you think that doesn't happen, but it does. And it happens extremely often. Um, sweetheart, cupcake, honey, don't call a woman by anything that could be associated with food. It's not appropriate. It, it really isn't. It's not a good look in real life, and it's definitely not a good look in the professional life. Um, I would be hard pressed to find a single woman attorney, and I, if you ask them, I guarantee they all say yes, that have not been mistaken for the court reporter than when they walk in for a deposition. It happens to us all the time. I don't know why we're in suits. We're showing up for deps. I don't know why, but it happens constantly. Um, I had. My, my friend had a conversation with an attorney who she has Esquire after her name, and this attorney, and this was maybe three months ago, went into a long discussion on her voicemail about how she be, should actually be called a housemaid and not an Esquire, because technically an Esquire is just a title for a man. That went right in front of a judge in the back room, and there were you know, consequences for that. There's no actual reason to do that. That goes back to those model rules. It's to, it's to harass and intimidate and, and, and use of power. Um, soft sexism is, so here's some issues. Just so you know, in 2016, I went to a CLA, and I think they're still doing this. The federal court has created a study of women in the legal profession that is fascinating. 
and it's Judge Zaney and then Justice, uh, and Chief Judge Castile who are holding juries after every case of people that are willing to listen to them and asking him about issues of gender and, and diversity and things like that. So for those of you that practice in personal injury as well, you're seeing very clearly that at least half of your jury are women. And it is not going over with the juries all that well when there's no women in the courtroom. And they are tracking things like filings, how many lead counsel women are, are in federal court, how many trial attorneys are women in federal court. And they're kind of trying to compile that data. And there was some interesting feedback. Um, one of the worst things you could do is if they felt a male attorney was speaking down to their female associate, it did not go over well with the jury. And unfortunately, we all know if the jury has a perception, you know, it affects a verdict. And that was one of the things. Now, that treatment actually went both ways. It was actually the way you spoke to either, like, to a, an associate on the other side or at your table with any kind of disrespect, but actually shot up a little bit when they were of the opposite sex. Um, there's some soft sexism things that, you know, I love a gentleman, and I encourage you all to continue being gentlemen, but it's not really appropriate to constantly be um, stepping back for a woman to go in front of you or opening doors or any of those kind of, kind of behavioral situations in front of a jury. So while it may be normal in everyday life, there has to be an equal playing field or a perception of equal playing field that should be in front of a jury. One of the things that was crazy to me is it was a trial at the end of last year. My friend was in a trial, she was second chair on a trial, and throughout the entire trial, opposing counsel referred to every attorney as Mr. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, and then her by her first name. That's that soft sexism. It's, there's no reason to do that other than the fact that it's a different kind of respect. Um, those are the things that the juries are watching and things that may not necessarily even be done knowing that you're doing it or knowing that it's lending to kind of discrimination and harassment, but things that should be floating around in your head. Um, I once had a case where uh, my whole firm went to Springfield to try a case for a month and a half and I took over uh, most of the practice. And I took over a case, it was a comp case, from opposing counsel, or from my counsel in my office and opposing counsel for four months, kept calling me Alex's assistant. Met with that attorney at the commission, argued in front of an arbitrator in front of him, well aware of the fact that I was an attorney and would always call me his assistant. Uh, there are also things that are said to women that I don't think are said to men when they're on the partnership track. Um, and they're things that maybe should have a little attention paid to them. I'm pretty sure there isn't a single man in this room that when they got told they weren't gonna make partner, it was because they were too competitive. Too outspoken, too competitive. Those are things that aren't said to men. Those are admired qualities in a man. And in a woman, it holds them back from partnership track. Um, I have surprisingly a number of friends who in open court have gotten accused of sleeping with the opposing party. To the point where they've had to write letters to the ARC and to the courts saying that, no I didn't. I don't think that really works the other way as often. Um, I don't think men's sexuality comes into play as often as women attorneys. And it's, it's unacceptable. Um, so for the overt sexism, these are things, these are real life situations that have happened very recently. Um, I've had friends whose bosses have asked them how much money it would take for them to sleep with them. Um, I was in a situation in a social event where a man came up to my friend and for a good five minutes was like, oh, oh come on, honey, you're, you're too hot to be a lawyer. You have to be a court reporter. Come on, you're not a lawyer. For like, and he wouldn't let it go. 
and I lost it a little bit and, you know, was confronting him with the issue. I later found out that night that was actually a judge. Um, there is a new <laughs> one of my friends was at a social event in one of the suburban counties and a judge came up to them and kissed them on the mouth, like open mouth. And she was like, that was creepy. And she later found out that that judge has an ongoing list of how many women attorneys he can do that to. And it's well known by all the male attorneys in that color county as well. Again, this is a judge, not even just opposing counsel. Um, don't know if this exists in Cook County. I do know that there's color counties where there's a hot or not list for attorneys, which to me is like high school. That's creepy. Um, I had an attorney, a judge say to one of my friends, I got a shot of five hour, five, uh, five hour energy if you want to hang around. It's, it's shocking. And, you know, I've had a, this conversation with attorneys in my office and like other male attorney friends who say that doesn't happen. It really doesn't happen. It doesn't happen every day. And I've started to every single time one of my friends says that to me. I, I go to them and I'm like, here you go. Here's another example. Here's what a judge, I saw a judge do. Um, there is, there are certain judges on the bench that we all know treat men and women very differently. And that's not just men. There are women that treat women attorneys in front of them uh, very, very differently. Um, I had an attorney tell me a story last week where she was a, at a large firm for a decade. She was made partner at that large firm. She left and went to another firm, and she was like, you know, I think I'm getting underpaid, but they're brand new to Chicago. And she had a couple of associate attorneys under her, and when they made partners, she's like, oh, I'm just gonna see how much he was making. She learned that she was making $40,000 less than that person as an associate. And that was three months ago at a major, major law firm in the city. Uh, so I do want to leave some time, and I don't know if anybody is going to be willing to like to speak up, but I think that an open communication about these issues is important. Um, so I do want to leave some time for this. I will say that, you know, combating it, this kind of harassment, discrimination environment takes everybody, and it takes everybody to acknowledge it and to stick up for it. I was in court the other day, and there were these two men sitting there going, can you believe that, that, that attorney, they were clearly talking about a female, wanted to change that order, that discovery order, can you believe that, what is she doing? She should just go into like mergers or acquisitions, what's she doing in court? Then the other man proceeded to tell him, yeah, I know, I have two daughters, I told them to go into finance, they'll be okay in finance, don't get your MBA, you know, they just don't understand that world. But you're in open court, like talk, if you're talking about that way about your daughter, I can't imagine what you're doing to your opposing counsel. And, and other women in the profession. Um, it's not enough to stand by and watch it happen and say, well, I don't participate that way, so that's okay. Uh, you have to require more when you see it, when you hear it, and you have to be conscious of the fact that you may be doing some of these things without even realizing it, and it's never gonna change without the whole landscape changing. Um, as managing partners, it's, it, it, or owners of firms, it's important that you foster that environment and that you discourage that and that when you hear it, you combat it. And um, I saw, you know, I didn't want to, like, I don't want to distract with, like, names and examples, so I've decided to leave that out of all my real life examples. But over the last year, uh, I have a friend that was confronted with something horrible and is still going through it. And I saw an example of two men. Uh, the partners in her firm do more than I can imagine anyone did. Not only was it unacceptable, she didn't bring charges against this person, they did. And they went to the federal court and they went to the ARDC and they made it very clear that that's not acceptable for any woman or especially the attorneys in their law firm to be treated that way. And it was a shining example of, you know, here's the thing, I, I can imagine, I mean, you know, a lot of us were like, what would happen if that was me? And you go and you may think you have a lot of support internally, but it doesn't mean that they're gonna go out of their way and stand up for what's really right, make sure there's accountability and consequences to that. And you know, sometimes that's uncomfortable, but that's what start, it has to start happening in order for this kind of environment to change. Um, 
Does anybody have any comments? Yeah, I think that, um, I'm not sure that it's really re reflected grade-wise as much because, you know, those curves really come into to play now. Um, I do think, you know, you're not seeing enough programs, like, encouraging diversity in those law schools from that beginning. So organizations like the Women's Bar Association are going into those law schools and creating these programs. Um, the mentor-menteeship is, is different. Um, I think that the law school organizations are a little bit, you know, skewed, but I don't know that it's an actual... Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. The question was, do you think that there is a problem in law schools on grading um, in, in diversity? And I've never heard that anybody thought that their grades were affected by that. I've heard a lot of the similar treatment, but no, I've never heard a complaint, and I don't see any research to that either. I, I could be wrong, but I haven't seen any about that specifically. Um, so I actually ran into a very close friend of mine from law school last week. She works at one of the big defense firms, and uh, she came pushed out because she was kind of crazy. She asked me two questions that I didn't really answer. The first is, when you go in for an interview and the conversation of, oh, well, are you planning on starting a family or getting married? Um, you know, that sort of conversation, sort of sniffing out whether or not you're a, a woman is potentially, you know, gonna, gonna have kids and how that will affect your career. What do you think is a good answer for that that sort of goes into the boundaries without stepping up people's feet? I mean, it's, it's the question was, in an interview process, if you're asked about your family planning, if you're having a baby or you're planning on having a baby, the good answer to that is, that's an illegal question to ask me. That's the answer. It's completely inappropriate and it's illegal. And I was going to say, I mean, maybe if the attorney you're interviewing for is asking you that question, maybe they're not the best example of a, an attorney you want to look with because maybe they should know the law a little bit better. The question is, how do you combat this environment without burning bridges and being a troublemaker? Well, we're seeing now that there's power in numbers. Yeah, women have to stick together. And there are men out there that believe this too, and you latch onto those people. I will tell you right now, insurance companies are honing in on this. Big companies and insurance companies are honing in. Diversity is a huge issue for all these companies, and they've got initiatives, and in general councils, a female general counsels are going up and up and up in these companies, and they are looking for female attorneys. And the other thing is this research is coming out with juries being half women and wanting that. They want the option of going to a woman attorney. Um, there's issues that arise and maybe cases that maybe could be more delicately sold to a jury by a woman. Um, Quiet women rarely make history. I, I, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's a standard of what is important to you. And there are those firms out there and there are people out there that will support you and pay you equal and support you. And, you know, maybe it's about focusing on that rather than making waves in somewhere that is unacceptable. But, I mean, the idea is that, like, if the, if it, the wave changes, that people will get on the wave. Um, but, you know, if you're not going to do it internally, do it externally. Let people know because we talk. And I've confronted a number of people at firms going, why don't you have a single female attorney ever? You know what I mean? Or, hey, I hear you're a woman. You know, I'm very careful to try and not point out like who it is, but you know, people are getting confronted with that from outside, like within the legal community without it being internally.
So the question is, if you regulate business bonuses based on billable hours, things like you know time worked, issues like that on the face, would it be considered discriminatory because you know women have childcare issues or things like that? Here's what I will say to that. That's where the flexibility of the workforce is important. Um, letting people, you know, maybe I gotta leave at five o'clock and go get my kid from daycare, but then I put them down at 7.30 at night and I can bill till 11 o'clock at night if I'm allowed to take that work home. Um, that's where that flexibility goes. Um, additionally, I would say that where that becomes discriminatory is the fact that if all the big complex litigation or all the big cases and big clients with the bigger workload is given to women, that's where it becomes discriminatory. If they're not given the same workload or responsibility as their male counterparts, it's going to have a discriminatory effect by its very nature. And I think that is often one of the issues. If you've got a huge multi-million you know, million dollar litigation and it's all men, you know, women are billing those hours. So I think those are the kind of the issues to, to work at. And there's, listen, I mean, especially if it is, there's attorneys, like your book of work is gonna have an issue on your pay. You know, and that's not really, when you look at these statistics, that's not really what they're looking at. They're looking at base salary. You know, but yes, there can be a discriminatory aspect to that. No? Oh, sorry. In Canada, both parties in a marriage get six months paid leave and they must get it and, and, and that's it. So do you support any of that kind of legislation? The question comes up, are you going to have children for a woman? Well, same thing's going to be for a man then. And it evens the playing field in that regard when you have to have a mandatory maternity leave of six months. I, I do, and the Women's Bar Association does too. Um, we have been working on a paid family leave um, that Senator Biss had introduced, and it's something that's still being advocated for. Um, and I do believe it's important to have a maternity and paternity policy as well. Um, we are the only major industrialized country that does not have that policy. Um, and I have friends that have, I've seen maternity policies from literally four weeks to six months. Like, not to get graphic, but you're not healed in four weeks, physically. And that expectation is crazy. And, you know, there's, there's all those studies that say productivity and, you know, time off and turning your brain off increases productivity in your clients. That child care and maternity leave is extremely important. And yes, we are advocating and trying to push that legislation through in Illinois. And it's, it's been on the floor a couple times. And we're still working on it. Yeah. Don't you think that in the short term there's, there's going to be, it's bound to be more of an adversarial atmosphere in a lot of the workplaces before all this gets sorted out? The kind of, of day-in, day-out behavior that you've been commenting about? Right, so the, if, I, if I'm understanding your question correctly is that, you know, as all this is getting sorted out that there's going to be an adversarial nature because you know, men are going to, we got this question a lot when we, when we did talk about the new ABA rule and they were like, so I got to like curve all my behavior and, you know, not act like I, is that what you're trying to get at? Worrying about what? Well, I, I, I think a lot of social mores are changing. I mean, as, as far as the, the Me Too movement, that's very, I, I think it's very beneficial. But I, I just think that when, when you start talking about, you know, your interview and Sure, I think there, there, there may be to a point, but it, it, it depends on those in power being men and women standing up and, and having the open conversation. 
I mean, you use the example of, you know, it's completely adversarial if you're asked about your family planning to say, hey, that's illegal. It's like having a phone interview with someone and saying, hey, are you black? It's not okay. Like, you can't, you can't do it. And so, like, if it has to be adversarial, then that's actually on the other side. And, not, like, here's what I will say. We are all aware, as women, that we are in a male-dominated field. We get it. And you have to know your audience. So, you know, very little actually offends me. Um, but I, I would lose it if somebody was actually targeting me or one of my friends. So there is, and I don't want to use the term locker room talk because I disagree with it, but there's, there's ways that you may talk in an environment that isn't the problem. <laughs> it isn't necessarily the language you use or it isn't the issues or topics you're talking about. It's when it's directed at those females and directed at people specifically that it becomes much more of a problem. And again, it is more outside the world than it is internally more so in offices from that, that perspective. Um, I do think it'll be amateurial. but yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's like everything else. A woman's a bitch when she speaks up and stands up for herself. And until that becomes, I mean, you know, we've seen it. We saw it nationally over the last year. And maybe it's hard to swallow, but if we all start doing it at the same time, then maybe it'll change a little bit quicker. But yes, that's generally the perception. And I, I mean, I think education is a tool. I think there's a reason there that, that the MCLE board is saying that these types of programs are not mandatory. So I, I think there needs to be an open line of communication. So. Yeah. So what's the Illinois law on pregnancy discrimination? Because federal law only applies to employers that have at least 15 employees. Is there an Illinois law that provides for people with greater access? So how many employees? I mean. I know the federal, when you say it's against the law, the federal law is 50, you have to have at least 15 employees. But you say it's the Illinois Human Rights Act, but what are the, how do you follow up on that? If you have, a, if somebody calls you, because people call us all the time with all these problems, and I don't know what to do for them because I don't really handle this, but we usually direct them to the EEOC, and then they call us back and say, well, you know, these laws don't apply to small employee, employers. So, so sexual discrimination does. Um, there, with sexual harassment and sexual discrimination, it doesn't matter how many employees you have. Uh, the problem with those cases is that right, there has to be an actual adverse employment action. And then Illinois, not sure of the actual language, but Illinois recently adopted a reasonable accommodation um, statute for pregnant women as well. Um, and that by, na by your nature of being pregnant, that there's certain reasonable accommodations that you can make that they now mandatorily have to abide by. Uh, but uh, the Illinois Human Rights Act pretty much mirrors the federal law. Uh, so we're one of those states where there's not that much difference between our, our state human rights act and the federal human rights act. Where in other states, there's huge discrepancies between them and ours is not really like that. They, they pretty much mirror each other. So, Dina, thank you so much for...